Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Redbeard and today we have another Chaos Dwarf speculation video. Today we will cover the unit roster and what we are likely to see as well as all of what is lawfully possible. Besides pure speculation, this video I have made as an outline or reference for what lawful units modders can add if they wish. I love this game in the modding community and hope the work I've done on my channel will help make this game all it can be. So for the unit roster, we will look at their army books and the supplements ranging from 4th, 5th, 6th, and 8th edition. For time's sake, I might not say where every unit originates from, but I'm taking the best from the army book, Tamarkan Throne of Chaos, Fantasy Roleplay, Forge World, Monstrous Arcanum, White Dwarf, The Nemesis Crown, Storm Magic, Ogre's Kingdom 6th edition, and Legion of Asgore, and if you can believe it, other sources as well. A lot of research went into creating the most complete and comprehensive lists possible for this video and this series. About 95% of these units are loreful, with that other 5% being completely plausible with what we know. I marked that 5% with an asterisk, though, so you can differentiate for yourself. So let's jump into what I expect the roster will look like when the race pack arrives. When you take into scope all the possible loreful units, there are actually too many. So I've refined the units into sections. So let's look at first what I believe to be the most likely roster. Come race pack. Let's start with infantry. There are three main variants. The first are slaves, which will be green skins mainly comprised of hobgoblins. Hobgoblins are a sort of middle ground between orc and goblin. Bigger and stronger than goblins, uh, not so with orcs. Where they lack, though, they make up for in speed and cunning. Chaos dwarves are even more so of a dying race than their cousins, so it would be very expensive in the early game. You will not be fielding full stacks of stunties, until at least the mid-game. Meaning you will need to bolster your numbers with hobgoblin chaff. This is where the contempt rule we talked about earlier in my last video comes into play. Now there are three main hobgob infantry units I think are necessary. First your standard chaff with sword and board, then a, a unit with bows, and lastly the sneaky gets. The first two are comparable to the green skin parallels, while sneaky gets are likely, uh, like slightly more elite noblar trappers. Stock, throwing knives, but perhaps some light anti-infantry as well. Now the Chaos Dwarves themselves can be divided into two camps. First the Chaos Dwarf Warriors and their ranged variants in the Devastators, who are low tier and comparable to Dwarf Warriors and Rangers. Second the Infernal Guard, who are more at the tier of Slayers, Longbeards, Bugmen's Rangers. The Chaos Dwarf Warriors and Devastators will take the 4th edition Babylonian tall pointy hat aesthetic, while the Infernal Guard will take the Tamarkan steampunk aesthetic. There has been a lot of debate over the years in the Total War forums on which aesthetic the overall dwarves should have. Rest assured, we are getting both. Those aesthetics pertain to different units. The more modern look is for the Infernal Guard, who are basically metal slayers. Whether they blew up a forge or lost a battle, they have brought themselves shame and must repent by taking the Dawizar version of the Slayer Oath. They have searing hot bronze masks fused to their face for the remainder of their service, which is often a life, a life sentence. If they gain great glory, they may have the mask ripped off, but only to reveal the scarred and ravaged flesh beneath. A horrifying existence, but elite faceless legions could not be more perfect for the Uskul Drazar. Additionally, infernal units wear black shard armor, which makes them near immune to flaming attacks. Zinch Hu. So for all the variants, Chaos Dwarf Warriors would have Axe and Shield, Great Weapons, and for the Ranged Devastators, Crossbows and Blunderbusses. For the Infernal Guard, we would have the same, except they would trade the Crossbows for something way more kick-ass, the Fire Glaive. So the Fire Glaive is very similar to the Streltsy's Gun Axe, except better. The bullets, quote-unquote, it shoots, would be Molten Magma. That, on top of doing flaming damage, may have AP, Armor Sundering, or Shield Breaker. Not all of them, but may have one. Representing these projectiles melting through anything they touch. I have a strong feeling this unit would become a player favorite, but probably expensive. Quite expensive. Around 300, I would, I would imagine. Quick note, if you have not heard of a blunderbuss before, it's basically a shotgun. High damage at short range. Uh, think Cathay's Iron Hail Gunners, backed by Dwarf Armor. Lastly, we have the Infernal Iron Sworn and the Immortals. The Iron Sworn are the upper echelon of the Infernal Guard, and I imagine will be implemented as a champion unit of roughly 16 entities, like the Aspiring Champions. 
They have shields and ensorcelled hand weapons, which gave them magical attacks. Not necessarily loreful, but if they wanted to get fancier, they might give the health give them the Hellfire Pistols, which is basically the Fire Glaive in pistol form. The Immortals. Based on one of the most famous groups of warriors in uh, the ancient Persian armies of our real history, could be a champion unit like Iron Sworn, but with great weapons. But I imagine them acting closer to Hammers. If Rakarth is in their army, they will also become unbreakable, but I will talk about Rakarth specifically more later. Now, I love the dwarves. They were the first race I played in Warhammer 1, but now that we got past the infantry section is where they are going to start getting cucked pretty hard. For light cavalry, we have Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders with spears and shield and a bow variant. If you've played Greenskins, you know what these guys are all about, albeit that these guys might be slightly sturdier, given that they... The hobgoblins ride step wolves, which are wolves that originate from the eastern steppes and are a little bit larger. Uh, for the monstrous cavalry, we have the dreaded bull centaur renders, an awesome mutation of the torso of a chaos dwarf and the body of a raging bull. Guardians of the Temple of Hasha and its sorcerers, they are completely devoted to the Father of Darkness. They are just as intelligent as any chaos dwarf, while being much stronger and faster, if not a little more rageful. Existing units we can compare them with are dragon ogres, and possibly centagores or minotaurs. So here we see all the stat cards for them, which I used to help create stat cards for the Bull Centaur Renders. First, they have the same scaly skin rule that Dragon Ogres have, which gives them 25% missile, res missile resistance base, which stacks with the shielded variants, possibly 55% for a total of 80%. These shielded variants would absolutely soak missiles without breaking a sweat. Perhaps they will give it a bronze shield that they feel the need to nerf it down a bit, after calculating this, though, it occurred to me the shielded variant might actually be a tier 5 unit. Lorefully, bull centaur regiments had no more than 12 entities, as they were few and rare. This would also lend them to having expensive upkeep, roughly 400 to 450 gold. I kept the dragon ogres nearly 10,000 health, but I could see it nerfed down by 5, uh, five to 1,500. They are said to be heavily armored, so I felt 90 was appropriate. 80 leadership and fairly high melee attack and defense due to being keen-witted sacred guardians. 70 speed seems right, as well as 44 per charge bonus. Minotaurs and dragon ogres have 110 weapon strength with 16 entities. So for the bull centaurs, 160 weapon strength with 12 entities is the ballpark I imagine they will be in. Also, bull centaurs are said to not heal naturally on their own and rely on their sorcerer masters to mend their wounds. Perhaps a good way to translate this to Warhammer, uh, Total War, is by giving a mutually exclusive skill to Sorcerer Prophets that either gives regeneration to Bull Centaurs or to Kadai. Uh, lastly, they could have a champion unit based off tabletop called a Bahal, but I feel that would be quite unnecessary, plus I have a much better way to implement them, which I'll, I will get to later. This is another unit I feel will be heavily favored in its utilization by players. Now for the beasts and monsters, tier 1 or maybe tier 2 we would have giant wolves, maybe the same that exist in game already, though lorefully the giant wolves of the hobgoblins are a bigger and stronger breed from the eastern steppes. For the Lord of the Rings fans out there, it's like comparing Isengard wargs to those of Gundabad. While we're on Middle Earth and the Dark Lands are basically Warhammer Mordor, but I digress. The Kadai are the demons of Hashit. Think blood letters or demonettes. The Kadai Fireborn fit the same lesser demon rule. This means they would have the demonic, demonic instability, and banished rules in total war. They are sorcerous flames bound into shape by armor like frameworks of metal. I can't decide if this means they would be ethereal or if they would just be heavily armored. Tell me in the comments what you think. We do know that they would be heavily resistant to any sort of flaming attacks or just outright immune. They had two unique roles. Blazing Body does flaming attacks to enemies it is in close combat with in a Mortis Engine style, but that might be overpowered in Total War for the, just an infantry unit. It also had the Burning Bright rule, which from the moment the battle started would slowly be draining its health. So here's what I propose for the Gadai. Combine those rules and then make it only activate when in melee or make it toggleable similar to Festus' ability. The Kadai also could take an officer called a Man Burner in Tabletop, which could translate to a new unit in Total War like Chameleon Stalkers. 
I didn't list it in the video, but could be a good parallel to Exalted Blood Letters or Demonettes. Think Exalted Kadai would be their uh, role. But we have a greater demon as well in the Kadai Destroyer. In tabletop, it could take several upgrades such as Razor Horns, Gore Blades, or Brazen Wings. Each upgrade give it a different design, being either a Gargantuan Bull, Minotaur, or basically the Balrog from Lord of the Rings. I think CA will just pick one, and the latter two are too much like the Bloodthirster, so I think it will be uh, the shape of a bull. A construct of blackened and jagged metal, suffused with glowing runes of binding and alive with hellish flame. The Destroyer would have all the same rules as the Fireborn, plus it causes terror and has hellish frenzy, which is just an upgraded variant of the standard frenzy. The Destroyer wasn't a caster in tabletop, but since it is basically a greater demon, perhaps it could have a bounce spell or two. The Kadai would cement the Dawizar as a chaos faction and hash it as a contender against the more uh, the major fate for chaos gods. The Bale Taurus shares some similar rules to the Kadai, so let's talk about that next. It would have the blazing body rule, so flaming mortis engine, but would not suffer the burning bright rule of the Kadai. Additionally, it would have a unique rule called Fueled by Fire, which means it converts any fire damage dealt upon it into health for itself, which is pretty freaking sweet, dude. Oh, did I mention it flies and causes terror too? The Lama Su would effectively be a variant of the Bale Taurus with none of the fire abilities but some magical ones instead. An ugly mutation not so dissimilar to a bull centaur with the head of a chaos dwarf, body of a bull, leathery wings, a club tail, and lion clawed front limbs. It would be a flying spellcaster unit similar to a coaddle. In tabletop it was a level 1 wizard that used spells from the lords of fire, death, and shadow. I think give it one bound spell from each, call it a day. Like the Bale Taurus, it causes terror, but the Lamasu has strong magic resistance. It also had a rule called Sorceress Miasma, which nullified all magic weapons in an aura. These two units might also have a lower tier variant called a Great Taurus that would function like a manticore. The last likely monster is the Chaos Siege Giant, who I touched on in a previous video. It's a giant that might actually be useful, gaining heavy armor, somewhat nullifying its greatest weakness. Uh, it might have an upgraded version of Wall Breaker. Its siege armor rule in tabletop gave it high m missile resistance as well. It could upgrade to have Runes of Hate, which would give it Berserk Rage or Frenzy. No doubt in a sea of Brad Giants, the siege giant would be a Chad. Moving on to artillery and war machines. First, we have the Hobgoblin Spear Chukka. Copy and paste bolt thrower from the dwarves. And while you're at it, give it to the Greenskins. It's a low tier, anti large AP artillery. After that, we have the Hell Cannon, which also already exists in the game. Gives a flaming, homing artillery option. Here's where things start to get a little more spicy. The Magma Cannon would be much like the Flame Cannon in that it fires balls of magma. The projectile would fire in a relatively horizontal line though, like a regular cannon. Lots of AP and fire damage, but most importantly, penetration. If the units stack up on each other, enemy units, these shots could slice through many ranks. Line of sight issues might make it difficult to line those shots up though. Now, let's get muy caliente. The Death Shriek rocket launcher will be a truly terrifying piece of equipment with two types of ammunition. The ammunition consists of a tubular rocket packed full of a chemical propellant synthesized from the abundant raw materials of the Plane of Zar. Also bound up within its munitions are howling malevolent fire spirits harvested from the cinders of Hashet's sacrificial altars, and it is the hellish shrieking of these spirits, when loosed, that gives the weapon its name. The packed multiple warheads detonate in the air above the battle in a storm of fire. Screaming fang tendrils of flame plunge downwards from the blast, seeking out lives on which to feed. How I imagine this operating is a similar effect to poison when mortars, with the air detonation and poisonous fumes left in its wake, the seeking capabilities of a hell cannon, but the fiery destruction of a hellstorm rocket battery. Sounds like an absolutely devastating combo, right? But that's just the ammunition in which it gets its namesake. 
you could toggle the ammo to demolition rockets for a more focused impact. This ammo would be best used if firing at large uh, SEMs or single entity monsters, walls, gates, or towers. This unit would uh, easily be tier 5 and expensive to boot. It would be one of the three units that would make Chaos Dwarves the best artillery race in the game. The next headliner, or maybe the headliner, is the Dreadquake Mortar. Queen Bess Who. The Dreadquake Mortar would become the most devastating artillery piece in the game. The massive shell that is fired was designed to bury itself before it explodes, creating devastating shock waves. Any surviving troops that were lucky enough not to be instantly liquefied will be in shock and have difficulty moving. This rule in tabletop was called Quake, which would act similar to Queen Bess's monstrous impact rule in Total War, which reduces speed by a staggering 76% for 10 seconds. The Dreadquake's mortar's uh, ability may also reduce melee defense and missile resistance additionally. The Dreadquake's deadly projectiles are fired by steam pressure that is generated by a boiler and contained within a pressure vessel. Conventional gunpowder being far too dangerous given the volatility of the Dreadquake's unique and powerful shells. As a consequence, it takes quite a while for the machine to generate enough steam to fire a single shot, limiting its potential in battle. In tabletop, it had the slow le reload rule, because all things need balance. In Total War, the Dreadquake should fire perhaps only once a minute. We've seen the AI in Warhammer 3, and unless you manually aim mortar shots, they might get dodged and miss entirely. The Dreadquake shells are of a secret construction whose arcana is the sole presence of the Chaos Dwarf Sorcerer Lords and Prophets of Hashet. When fired, they burst into a roaring blood-red light, and when they strike, it smashes buildings apart like a hammer blow from the gods, bleeding crimson from the wounded earth. This means it may have magical damage as well as deal additional damage to buildings. Another way Dreadquakes might be balanced is they might not be available for recruitment, but only as an upgrade to the Iron Demon. Which brings us to the possible centerpiece unit for the whole roster. The easiest comparison we have for the Iron Demon is the Steam Tank. Highly armored, armor-piercing, causes terror, and is unbreakable. The demon is the locomotive of a potential train and is designed to tow steam carriages. Originally, it was designed for tunneling mines and crushing rock and ore and the towed carriages to haul ore in lieu of beasts of burden, such as horses and oxen who often perished and would need replacing. It was not long before these engines were also deployed on the battlefield due to their obvious merits for hauling cannons, rockets, mortars, and other weapons. If implemented lorefully, the demon will become not only one of the most powerful but also unique units in the trilogy. As I showed before, I think it would be solely recruitable after purchase in the Blessing of Hashship mechanic. Once recruited, perhaps you could use a jerry-rigged version of the Warband upgrades for the Iron Demon. You could choose one upgrade for the locomotive. One version is the steam carronade, which attaches to twin cannons, uh, attaches twin cannons to the front that blast red-hot curse-laden shrapnel into the ranks of the enemy. The other is the skullcracker, which is an arcane mechanical conglomeration of crushing hammers, swinging picks, and hacking blades designed to crush fortification and pulverize anything unfortunate enough to be in front of it which would give it the wall breaker attribute and increased melee performance. Now, all versions of the locomotive have the demolition rule, which in tabletop meant that it would ignore terrain classified as obstacles and would remove them after the Iron Demon passed through. So for Total War, that could translate to instantly destroying any blockades within settlements and possibly gates when the demon makes contact with them. Or maybe just it needs to attack once and then it's gone. Terrain with water, though, may count as impassable. It also had the lumbering and unstoppable rule, which meant it could only charge in a straight line forward and cannot pivot. So for Total War, I think this would translate to low speed but very high mass. Uh, it would also turn in very wide arcs, meaning turning around in settlements would be next to impossible, so you just have to keep going through, which gives more uh, credence to the demolition rule we 
just talked about. Uh, also, the about face control might be turned off completely. For the steam carriage upgrades, perhaps you would unlock them at a certain rank. So at rank 3, you can add the magma cannons in tow. Rank 6, you could add the death shrieker. And at rank 9, you could finally get the dread quick mortar. You could only have two steam carriages though at a time, so when you get the Dreadquake, you'll have to scrap one of the others. So the Dreadquake is only depicted on the steam carriage, which I think would be a nice way of making sure you can't just feel the whole bunch of Dreadquake mortars. That being said, it wasn't in the army book, but the Earthshaker cannon is nearly identical in its description and is always depicted as manned by a ground crew. This could be implemented as a slightly nerfed version with unit caps, which leads us into our next section of possible but like less likely units. Orc and Goblin slaves are possible but somewhat redundant for Chaos Dwarves, but may be better suited in a Hobgoblin Conate roster. Black Orcs were created by Chaos Dwarves, but hadn't seen many winters before they incited a massive rebellion. So, same as the slaves may be good for the Hobgoblins, Conate, uh, race or subrace, perhaps not the Dowies are. Zealot Berserkers are too similar to Slayers and don't really fit this roster. Instead of Deathblow, they would have Frenzy, they would have the Mark of Hashet, which would give them physical resistance and flame resistance. They may also be anti infantry. The Acolytes of Hashet are a champion unit of lesser sorcerers of perhaps between 30 to 60 entities. They would be an elite anti large halberd unit with magical attacks. They had special Dirges of Hashet, a rule that they could choose one of three songs before battle. The Dirge of Fury gave them Hatred, which I would interpret as a form of Rampage that gives extra damage dealing stats. The Dirge of Brutality gives the unit Killing Blow, and the Dirge of Defiance gives Ward Save. Now, maybe in battle they could just switch between one of these rules. I also listed the unit as using naphtha bombs, but their rules do not specifically say so in tabletop. The weapon is used by demon smiths and sorcerer prophets, so I thought it might make the acolytes more unique and worthy of the roster. It could be a multi-use bound ability like the characters, or simply a ranged weapon with limited ammo. I imagine the naphtha bombs functioning like something between death globes and iron breaker charges. I think this unit to be quite special, but I unfortunately don't think CA will include it. Acolytes could also carry a petrified sorcerer. I think this unit uh, could be translated to something similar to Bretonia's Grail relic Reliquay. Yes, that unit is terrible, but maybe the petrified sorcerer could act as a model of how it could improve. The unit would have barrier to reflect its rule of invulnerability until the acolyte carriers are killed. It would give units in its aura leadership, magic resistance, and allow them to cause fear, which I think would make it a much better support unit. And, you know, maybe the Grail Reliquay could, you know, be inspired and learn from this. For weapons teams, we have Inferno Guns, which are a weapons team variant of blunderbusses. They would fire a very wide arc of hot shrapnel. I would think it to have flaming and armor piercing damage that could decimate ranks of infantry, especially undead. Bazookas could be very interesting, similar to Trollhammer torpedoes, but again, it's a weapons team variant. I imagine them being less about anti large and more anti infantry. Lots of splash damage here, firing at a lower arc and higher velocity, which means more range than the Trollhammer torpedoes. Not by a large amount, but somewhere in the ballpark of 25 to 50 more range, maybe. For war machines, we have the Whirlwind and the Tenderizer. Both are chariots that are pushed, not pulled, by a bull centaur. The Whirlwind would have scythed wheels and rotating flails that would make it excel at breaking up groups of infantry. The Tenderizer has concussive implements that mash together, crushing anything in between. This variant would be better suited for armored large units. So, for these uh, two chariots, the Whirlwind and Tenderizer, for any Halo fans out there, think kind of of the Chopper uh, vehicle. But again, it's pushed by a Bull Centaur. The Juggernaut Siege Tower is simi similarly pushed by Bull Centaurs. Think Grand from The Return of the King, Lord of the Rings. Despite its, names, it, uh, its name, it may not be able to dock on walls, like a siege tower, 
siege equipment, but rather would function as a highly armored artillery platform. Armed with two powerful cannons in front and infernal guard with fire glaives firing from the top, it would function as a chariot, slow but crushing anything in its path. Additionally, it may have uh, an AO AOE bound explosion as the demonic spirits trapped within spew forth highly corrosive phlegm. Oh, and it would be unbreakable. For more standard units, we might see a variant of the low tier imperial and vampirate mortar. This, uh, so the earth shaker gun I talked about before. The swivel gun could be an artillery version of the blunderbuss. An imperial cannon with hail shot that pivots quickly. The chaos giant could be thrown in since we'll have the siege version at a higher tier. The great Taurus could be a fire, feral variant of the Bale Taurus and Lamassu. Basically, it's a manticore, as I said before. The Colossus is a construct that functions like a rogue idol, but upon death, it explodes like a bloated corpse, but with fire damage. I also think you could just give this um, death explosion, uh, fiery death explosion, to the great uh, the Kadai Destroyer. And call it a day, but if you wanted to give a construct unit, I, they basically would act the same, though. Lastly, furnace golems were in the works in 6th edition, but the employee who was working on them left the company before he was finished. They would be constructs roughly the size of trolls with heavy armor and flamethrowers. If implemented, they could act as a useful blueprint for storm fiends for Skaven and rune golems for the old world dwarves. So that about covers the unit roster we might expect from a chaos dwarf race pack. I originally was going to make one video covering lore mechanics, lords, roster, and more, but it would have been roughly two hours long or more. So I've split what I've been working on for the last few weeks into a handful of videos all focused on chaos dwarves. First was lore, then mechanics, now units, and next will be legendary characters, lords, and heroes, and I might have more after that as well. So stay tuned for that. I'd say I've put more work into these Chaos Dwarf videos than anything I've produced thus far for the channel. On top of that, I'm working on uh, with the assembly kit to make my starting armies mod, whilst also attempting to learn scripting to make more compatible mods. All that being said, I have to go to my actual job to pay bills, which is why the content on the channel has been a little slow recently. I am working though, don't you fret. So if you want to support myself and my content in these pursuits, please like, comment, subscribe, share my videos, and don't forget to hit the bell notification so you don't miss any of my uploads. Or whatever it does. Who knows what it does. Because <laughs> sometimes my viewers still say they, um, they... They miss the uploads even if they hit it. But, you know, you might have a better chance of not missing the uploads if you hit that. I'm Redbeard, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.